Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of chapter two. Uh, we're going to be doing this in four parts. So what I want to do is jump right on into this part and talk about chemical bonds. Uh, we'll do some of the organic chemistry section um, and then uh, we'll do the uh, or uh, then we'll do like the um, uh, section on water, then the organic chemistry section. So that one might be a little bit longer, um, uh, depending on how we work it. Uh, we'll see if that how that works. Um, but I want to at least do all the section here uh, on the basics uh, of the inorganic chemistry, and then I'll have the section on water, and then the section on organic chemistry. Okay. So what we want to do, guys, is start with chemical uh, bonds. Uh, so there are ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. These are types of chemical bonds. So chemicals, remember, are two more atoms bonded together. And what we can do is we can put these together and make larger things called molecules or compounds. To build them, we need chemical bonds. Now, chemical bonds are uh, ionic bonds. They're going to result when electrons are transferred from one to another. We result in two uh, ions that are oppositely charged that form a bond. Uh, covalent bonds, we share uh, pairs of electrons in the valent shell. And hydrogen bonds, we have two mo molecules that are polar that contain hydrogen and they interact from a negative to positive uh, charge. So we're going to talk about these. We're going to start off with our ionic bond. Now with ionic bond, what I like to start with here is explain that is that there are ions and ions are atoms with charges so what we're going to do is i'm basically going to go through and just explain the notes um right here and let's start off um with uh, let's say we have an atom of sodium okay so let's just put in a for sodium in the nucleus and let's have a shell right here, okay? And let's say that first shell that we have, uh, we have t uh, two electrons in the first shell, okay? We have a second shell here. All right, so that is 10. And now, sodium, who is number uh, 11. All right, and we're going to put one right here, okay? Now, if we were to take a look at this atom and we were to gain some information about it, number one, we would say this is a sodium atom, and that's the uh, thing for sodium, that is its symbol. And what we could say about it is that it has 11 protons, okay, um, and also 11 electrons, okay. So its charge is zero. I usually have a little bit more room to write that on. I'm going to run out of room. I'll have to kind of write some stuff down here for the other atom. Now. What's going to happen over here? Let's let me get the information. I had that one already looked up. Uh, I'm going to need the information for chlorine. Uh, chlorine is a uh, is number seventeen. Okay, chlorine is number seventeen. Okay, so let's get chlorine and get it and at number seventeen. Okay, so number seventeen, chlorine. Okay, so let's say we have chlorine. Okay. First shell would have two. Second shell would have eight. Then the third shell would be almost full. With seven. Okay, now we look at this. We have two atoms here. 
Both of them are reactive because both of them they have the valent shell. Both valent shells, third shells, want eight because these are not past argon. If we take a look at them, they're not past argon. Um, this is the way that chemistry works, okay? So if you're uh, chlorine's here, sodium's here, they're not past argon yet. So their third shell only holds up to eight electrons. So neither one of them have a filled electron shell, filled valent shell, okay? So they don't have a filled valent shell. So what's going to happen is uh, they're going to want to form a, uh, a special type of bond. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute and make sure I got everything right. They're going to want to form a special type of bond. So there are atoms that transfer. Now, why do they transfer? Our book doesn't really do a very good job of this uh, from what I, uh, when I wrote the lecture. So I'm going to explain it and talk about why it does. And I'm going to sneak down here. And I'm going to get this little di uh, diagram here. I want to talk about electronegativity real quick. Now, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but let me uh, talk about this. This is this idea of how much affinity an atom has for electrons. It's called its electronegativity. Now, what this table has done is the taller the tile is, the more electronegative it is. Now, what you will see a general trend is this. Right here, the least electronegative element on the periodic table is Fr francium. It's the least electronegative atom. And then it gets more electronegative as we go up this way in a general trend up here to fluorine, the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Chlorine is quite electronegative, not as electronegative as fluorine, but quite electronegative. Since it is quite electronegative, chlorine will have a greater affinity for electrons. Now, what does that have to do with anything here? Let me explain this to you, okay? Now, let me help you understand this just so you have a greater um, understanding here. So, chlorine, Cl, we would say it had 17 protons. It had 17 electrons, and charge was zero, okay? I can make that a little bit smaller. I can. I wish I had smaller markers for purple. Okay, so let's just try to get that. Sodium, okay, had 11 protons, 11 electrons, and charge was zero. Chlorine had 17 protons, 17 electrons, and a charge of zero. Okay, now, what's going to happen? Chlorine wants electrons more than sodium does, based on that graph I showed you, okay? Now, case in point with this, it wants electrons more. So what it's going to do, now let's also think about it, it just needs one more electron to fulfill its valence shell. Sodium needs um, seven more. It's going to be, e for this greedy electron to steal one from sodium is going to be very easy. So what's going to happen is this chlorine is going to transfer, it's going to take this electron here, it's going to steal it, okay, like that. And what's going to happen is, the outer shell is going to get smaller here, like that, okay? And what we're going to do, if we looked at sodium, what's going to happen? Now, I'm going to write Na for the time being. It has 11 protons, but now it has 10 electrons. So the charge is now one up proton is now plus one. So we call this Na plus. And for chlorine, it still has 17 protons, but now has 18 electrons. The charge now is negative one. So we'll put a minus on it, okay? Why is it? Because it gained this extra electron there, okay? So what happened, it went from being a, a, a neutral atom to transferring electrons from one to another, and it became ions. It became a positive ion called a cation, 
and a negative ion called an anion, okay? Positive ions called cations are electron donors. They donate electron, they give up electrons. They become more positive because they have more protons than they do electrons, so now they're positive charge. The negative ions called anions, they're electron acceptors. Why are they called that? They accepted the electrons. They now have more electrons than they have protons, so now they are now more negative. And when you have these, there is a very strong attraction between these two ions called an ion ionic bond, well, they will come together and form a very strong ionic bond, and they are very strong attraction. So an ionic bond will form when these two guys come together of oppositely charged ions, okay? Very important, and we can see that, okay? So the opposite charges attract, like charges repel in chemistry, okay? So what we want to do, we got that down. I hope we understood that phenomenon, that uh, particular thing, okay? All right. So what you'll see here is the Cl- minus and the Na- plus will form bonds. So this is how it forms. The sodium atom comes in, and the chloride, the sodium atom, gives its one electron up. And when it does, the chlorine atom becomes uh, negative, and the sodium atom becomes positive, and they interact positive and negative, forming a very strong bond called a ionic bond, called an ionic bond. And those form uh, compounds. It's always going to be a compound because you have to have two different elements of different electronegativities. Okay, now... This gives us an interesting phenomenon here called uh, redox reactions. And let me explain redox. Redox is about uh, adding and gaining electrons impacts charge. That is redox. Redox stands for reduction oxidation. Now, this is a little bit annoying. So before I even define it, let's just basically uh, do this. This can be really confusing to students who are first learning it. And right here, I'm going to put a positive sign. And right here, I'm going to put a negative sign. And basically, right here, I'm going to put zero, okay, neutral, okay? Now, if you start at zero and anything uh, uh, starts to lose negative charges, lose electrons, you'll go more positive. If you gain electrons, you'll go more negative, okay? So let's say I have here that uh, an electron were to be lost. That will take me in a more positive direction. But here on the other hand, okay, electrons are added and that takes us down, okay? So what happens? When we lose electrons and gain electrons, we affect the charge, okay? Atoms are fundamentally neutral. They lose or gain electrons. When they gain electrons, they will become more negative. What this process is called is reduction because basically think of it as I'm reducing the charge, making it more normal, negative. I mean more normal, more negative. Here we're getting it more positive, this is called oxidation. Now, I don't want to go too much into, but if you guys had some good chemistry in school, you may learn about oxidation values. You're, you're changing that number, okay? So I hope this made sense, okay? Leo Gur, okay? Leo Gur. All right. Leo, loss of electrons, oxidation. Ger, gain electrons, reduction. Okay, Leo Ger. All right. Now let's talk about covalent bonds. Now covalent bonds, what you're doing is you're sharing electron pairs. You're sharing electron pairs, and this is a very strong bond. It's always strong. Now one of the things I put up here, I said that ionic bonds are strong when solid but weak when wet. Now they're strong when they're solid, and that is the strongest bonds you can actually have. But they're very weak when they're wet. In fact, the strongest bond in nature is the ionic bond. But because it's weak when wet, and life 
we are two, roughly two-thirds water, let's just say we're two-thirds water, then that is going to break ionic bonds. Ionic bonds disassociate or break, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, okay? Now, what I want to do is talk about the formation of covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds, remember, if you have atoms that have unfulfilled valence shells, they will form bonds, okay? They will form a bond. They have to be reactive, and they have to find two that they can react with, and they will share electrons between each other to fill themselves up. So basically, they're like people that have to, to in order to be happy, have to be in a relationship, okay? Now, we have single, double, triple covalent bonds. And let's talk about single, double, triple covalent bonds here a little bit, and let's just talk about them. Okay, I'm going to use my fine tip marker because it does write very neatly, and I can. So let's talk about single, double, triple covalent bonds. Um, now, single bond. Let's just do a really simple thing. Let's just do something really simple. Let's do H2. Okay, what H2 would basically be is me take a hydrogen atom here, and this dash sign is a single covalent bond to another hydrogen atom. Okay. So basically what we're going to do, if we took a hydrogen atom right here, let's just draw the symbol for hydrogen in the nucleus, and we come in and we draw its first shell, and it's one electron right here, and we had another hydrogen atom right here, its nucleus, and its first shell, and we drew its outer electron, its valence electron here, what we would see is, is these guys right here, this hydrogen needs one more electron to be happy. The first shell can hold two electrons. It's only got one, so it's unfulfilled. This one here has only got one electron. It needs two, okay? How can they get happy? If they came in and shared this pair of electrons right here, then basically what happens is this hydrogen here, he gets the one he has and that one. And this hydrogen here gets the one he had, and that one, they're sharing the pair. So what they've done is they formed a single bond. This is called a single bond, a single covalent bond, okay? Now, what if we wanted to do two pairs of electrons? One of the places this happens is carbon dioxide, CO2, where we put carbon in the middle, and what we do, these two dashed lines right here, they're going to represent the bonds between oxygen atoms, okay? These two dashed lines are going to represent a double covalent bond, okay? So if I had a carbon atom, like our normal carbon right here, And an oxygen first shell here, two electrons. Okay, we're going to draw it like that. Okay, now, we need two more electrons to make this oxygen happy. So what we're going to do is we're going to come here, and we'll share that pair and this pair. Now, this oxygen is happy, but this carbon still needs two more. So we're going to go over on this side, share that pair and that pair. And what we have now is what is called a double bond. Now we can also do a triple bond. We might find this in something like C2H2, where our two carbon atoms here form one, two, three bonds with each other, and one with a hydrogen. Okay? So let's draw carbon.
and a hydrogen. Let me make that hydrogen a little nicer. I like to label the shells. Oops. Sorry, my uh, I've been drawing so much. My uh, hope I hope you guys didn't see it go black there for a second. Okay. All right. So what we're gonna do? Right there. We have our triple bond. There's our triple. There's a double. And there's our single. Okay. Now, that's how they form, okay? That is how they form. Uh, but I like to show you. So a single bond is sharing one pair of electrons. That's two total. A double bond is sharing four, uh, two pairs, four total. And a triple bond is sharing three pairs or six total electrons. Okay. Now, these can form special kinds of bonds. Now, what we actually call these, there are special kinds of covalent bonds. And this comes back to our little friend that we talked about was uh, electronegativity. Electronegativity is this idea that atoms have um, an unequal pull for electrons, okay? Now, I really want to have that in my notes, but our book just doesn't explain it very well, and I added electronegativity here, so I went ahead, and that's also why you get uh, electronegativity is one of the reasons we get um, uh, ionic bonds, ions can form because of electronegativity. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about the electronegativity is an unequal share where one atom strongly pulls uh, electrons towards itself um, called electronegativity. And right here, uh, let's say we had H2O, H2O. Oxygen is quite electronegative, a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen. So kind of think of it this way. Let's say we're pl playing tug of war. These really electronegative atoms are very strong at playing tug of war, whereas the less electronegative, electronegative atoms, they're not as strong. So the more electronegative atom wins and pulls the electrons towards itself in an atomic tug of war. Now, what's going to happen is this: when these covalent bonds form, you end up with basically – uh, these electron pairs right here sticking out, this pair here and this pair here sticking out. With no electron pairs here, because oxygen is more electronegative, all the electrons are pulled this way. They're pulled towards this. And so this end has got two, pair, uh, or two pairs. It's got a pair here and a pair here, making this end have two minus charge. It has a partial sigma negative. This end with no electron pair sticking out has a partial positive charge. And this creates something very interesting, okay, where the more electronegative atom pulls the electrons towards itself. The atom with a strong electronegativity is called electronegative, and it pulls the atoms towards itself. Now, this can mean that sometimes we don't share electrons equally, that uh, we don't really, if we were to map the electron density, we would see that the electron density is on one side of the molecule far greater uh, if we map the electron density of something. So if we actually did that, um, uh, then we could see that, okay? Now, um, there are nonpolar and po polar covalent bonds. Nonpolar covalent bonds are when we have two of the same electronegativities, like hydrogen to hydrogen equals sharing of electrons. Atoms have the same pull, uh, like hydrogen to hydrogen, oxygen to oxygen, okay? That's nonpolar molecules. Those are things like oils. Now, 
Polar covalent happens when the unequal sharing. This is involved in atoms that are disproportionately strong. There is one electronegative atom and another is not, like uh, water, H2O. Okay. So this is what we mean by electronegativity, like fluorine, really electronegative, oxygen, quite electronegative. Oxygen is a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen. Uh, you know, but these guys, not very much as well. So what you'll see is, is that um, the, uh, uh, the more electronegative atoms, they like to form uh, anions. And the less electronegative atoms like to form cations. Okay. All right. Now, hydrogen bond. How does that work? Uh, so, so it works by basically because we have uh, polar covalent molecules like water. So let's take a polar covalent molecule compound. Be more precise. I like being precise with my language uh, that we have some compounds. So let's say we have a compound like water. Okay. So I have a water comp uh, water molecule here. Water compound. Uh, so oxygen is right here. Hydrogen is right here. Okay. Now, there is a partial negative charge, actually two partial negative charge, because there's an electron pair sticking out here and an electron pair sticking out here. Over here, there is a partial, and that could have been really nice when I wrote my sigma. Let me write my sigma nicer. Usually I try to write my sigmas. Partial positive. Partial positive. Okay. All right. Now. What's going to happen is, is if I took a, a hydrogen right here from another water molecule who was partially positive, okay, here we have the oxygen, okay, remember it's got a two partial negative. What would happen is an association between these would form opposite to uh, negative to positive called a hydrogen bond. And this is why if I take water and put it in a cup, I can put more water than the cup can hold. If I had a cup and I filled it full of water, I could have water kind of bubbled up over the top and it would be holding it. It's because of hydrogen bonds. This is why water beads up on your hood after waxing it and cleaning your car, things like that. So, all right. So I hope that made sense, the hydrogen bond. Okay, the hydrogen bond is a very important bond. It occurs between two polar compounds that have hydrogen in it. Uh, they have to be polar. They have to be result from the unequal sharing of electrons. Remember, nonpolar is equal sharing. Polar is unequal sharing of electrons. I really hope that I made that make sense, and I hope I explained it well enough for you guys to really kind of grasp because it's a really big idea. Really, it's very important that we understand polar versus nonpolar covalent bonds. This is determining how certain drugs are going to work in the blood uh, because of that, so very big deal that you learn that. Chemistry, that's a very important thing to learn when it comes to pharmacology, okay? and learn some things about drugs. So if we were to take the covalent bond in the human body, covalent is going to be the strongest. A triple will be stronger than a double, a double stronger than a single. Single is stronger, though, than ionic bonds in the body because though ionic bonds are strong when they're solid, they're weak when they're wet, and we're two-thirds water. Then the hydrogen bond is always the weakest bond. Hydrogen bond is always a weak bond, okay? Now, let's talk molecular weight. Now, molecular weight is a pretty complex phenomenon at first. So let me help you understand it. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is explain it on a board, uh, talk, and then we'll look at the notes. Okay. So let's say that I had my car and I wanted to know how much my car weighed. And all I have is a bathroom scale. Okay. 
all I have is a bathroom scale and some wrenches. And I want to know how much my car weighs. I want to know how much my 2022 Dodge Challenger RT Plus weighs. So what I might have to do with my car is I could take it apart, okay? Take it apart and get the hydrogen and the oxygen and take it apart. Weigh the hydrogen, weigh the oxygen, add those together and get the mass, okay? So, for example, with H2O, if I were to look at hydrogen, well, what is the mass of a hydrogen atom? What is its weight anyway? What is the weight of a hydrogen atom? Well, normally I have a periodic table on the wall, so I'm going to have to roll all the way up here. We're going to have to find hydrogen, and we're going to have to look at the hydrogen atom on the periodic table, and we're going to see it's one point. O O eight. Okay. Okay, one point O O eight. All right. Now what we're gonna do that's one point O O eight. Okay. Now there are two of them. So that's times two. They are two point O one six. Uh, that's the weight, okay? Now, what does oxygen weigh? What is the weight of oxygen, okay? Well, we got to go look it up. We got to go find oxygen on the periodic table. So, the periodic table of oxygen is 15.999. 15.999, okay? All right, now there's only one of those. So what we have to do now is add up our 2.016 and add that to 15.999, and we'll get 18.015 Daltons is the unit, Daltons. And that's how we do a molecular weight. That is how a molecular weight is done. If you want to do a mass, you could do the atomic masses, but we're doing a molecular weight, okay? And I will have you guys calculate molecular weight on the test, okay? I will have you do a molecular weight for my test, okay? Sorry, I keep clicking on things I don't need to click on. Okay, so let's go back down here, and it's fine, molecular weight. Okay. Now, I'll do the chemical reactions, energy concepts, and reactions, and then what I'm going to do is stop at water, okay? Okay, so let's do chemical reactions, um, and then the types of reactions. Okay, so we got molecular weight. I hope that makes sense, uh, and that you guys can do that. Uh, so let's give you guys, but while we're doing that, actually... Let's, let's do a different one. Let's just do a different one here. Let's do a different practice uh, so that we did one that's not on the notes together, okay? And I'll work on it with you guys. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I sneezed right in the middle of the recording. I'm not going to stop and try to redo it, and I don't want to pause. So. Okay. Larry was a chemist, but Larry is no more. What he thought was H2O, which H2SO4. Okay. So what do we got? We got hydrogen, we got sulfur, we got oxygen. Okay, now, hydrogen. What's the mass of hydrogen? We got to go back and look it up. So let's get our masses. I want to write them down. So let's find our mass of hydrogen. I have to, uh, so it is 1.008. What is the mass of sulfur? Let's go over here and look up sulfur. 32.06. And oxygen, 15.99. Okay. Cool. All right. So, that's what we got. Now. There are two of these, so 1.008 times 2, that is 2.016.
Sulfur, okay, that's 32.06. There's only one of them. And oxygen, that is times 4. I'm going to use my calculator on that. And that is 63.996. We need to add these suckers together. So 63.996 plus 32.06 plus 2.016. And that is 98.072 Daltons. Okay. So it's like taking the parts of a car, taking a car apart, and weighing each individual part separately and then adding them together. Okay? Atomic weight. Alrighty, let's get to, to back to that. Okay, so I hope molecular weight, rather not atomic weight, but uh, uh, you take the individual atomic weights, add them together, and get a molecular weight. Okay, organic versus inorganic. Um, pretty simple, straightforward. We can learn this. Uh, the inorganic compounds, what they're going to do, guys, they are going to contain carbon and uh, – they can contain carbon. They can contain hydrogen, but not both. They usually have other elements like chlorine, iron, magnesium, or something like that. For example, H2O, CO2, NH4, um, those kinds of things, okay? Now, so NaCl, what have you. Now, um, organic compounds, they have to have carbon. They have to have hydrogen. They may also have sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, that kind of stuff, chomps, C-H-O-N-S-P, uh, things like C-H-4. Sorry, I do not know why that the 4 is not subscript here. I don't know why. i got to fix that in my notes, but I have to go to the office to do that because the notes are on my office computer, and I have to change it there, or it does me no good because that's where I will put them on the computer. So I apologize for not having that on there. Okay. So, um, all right, chemical reactions. Now, chemical reactions... I like to think chemical reactions is kind of like uh, is kind of like football. Okay, uh, playoffs about ready to happen. The NFL, all that good stuff. Um, so, chemical reactions—they're kind of like football games, where each an individual player in American football they go into motion, they bump into each other, they collide, things happen, uh, plays are made or broken. Okay, chemical reactions are making and breaking chemical bonds. Okay, you make and break chemical bonds. Okay, now uh, there are two things that go into it. What goes into it is called a reactant. We say that's what gets rearranged. Your reactants get rearranged. What comes out of the reaction, what it got rearranged into, those are products. Now these reactions could be, for example, A plus B makes AB, or AB is broken down into A plus B. It could be a building up reaction or breaking down reaction as we're about to see. Now, reactions, they always have reactants going into be products. Reactants yield products, okay? Now, in this whole reaction, there is energy at stuff. This is an example. Chemistry can be a type of work that a cell does, okay? Work is the ability to cause change. Chemical reactions is a type of work that cells do, chemical work, because sometimes we use energy to do the chemical reactions. And when we do, like if ATP drives a chemical reaction, then that is an example of chemical work. Work is the ability to cause change. Energy is what drives work. There's kinetic energy, the energy of motion. That is also potential energy, the energy of position, like water behind a dam. The electricity in your battery, okay? Energy of position. Chemical energy is a type of potential energy found in chemical bonds. Like when we burn wood, the potential energy of cellulose in wood is combusted to release thermal energy and light in a chemical reaction, okay? When we eat food, the energy of food is converted to energy used to power our heartbeat and our brain functions, our, our breathing and everything else that we do, all that kind of work in the cell, okay? 
Now, this will be the enzymes, metabolic reactions. That's where we're going to end today. Uh, that's where we're going to stop. So let's talk about the different kinds of reactions. Decomposition reactions, decompositions. This is where we break things down. So think about a dead skunk in the road. Uh, when you have a dead skunk in the road, it breaks down. It decomposes and breaks down. Decomposition is sometimes called catabolic reactions. If this reactants break down, reactants are bigger than products, okay, then AB, which is larger, which is a combination of two things, is broken down into A plus B. Now, if water is involved, if water is added in a decomposition reaction, this is called hydrolysis, okay? Now, in a synthesis reaction, what is referred to as an anabolic reaction, because anabolic is building things up, Reactants are put together, so the reactants are smaller than products. For example, A and B are put together to make AB. A plus B make AB. This is sometimes, like I said, it's called synthesis. If water is removed, we call this a dehydration or a condensation reaction. Then exchange reactions. Exchange reactions are like that cup and ball game that you see people playing in alleyways uh, in the city where they're like, follow the ball, follow the ball. They shuffle it around. They get shuffled around, okay? Parts of the reacting molecules are just shuffled. They make new combinations. Like if I had AB plus CD and I got AD plus CB, we shuffled things around, a shuffling reaction. Basically, we do a decomposition followed by a synthesis in a series. Then there's reversible reaction. They move forwards and backwards. They at the same rate. If they reach an equilibrium, that's when they're in balance. Uh, and anything that you add, very important statement I'm about to make. If I have an equilibrium and a reversible reaction, and I add something to one side of this equilibrium, I shift the equilibrium to the other side. Very important when we get to acid-base balance in the chemistry um, that we do when it comes to acid-base balance, when it comes to the uh, um, uh, A and P2 class, okay? And when you guys learn acid-base balance issues with the body. Very important, okay? Now, lastly, uh, lastly we have enzymes and metabolic reactions, and we're done. Enzymes are like catalysts. They are what we call biological catalysts. What is a catalyst? Catalyst is a reaction persuader. Think of it this way. Let's say there's a re restaurant that you like to go to, but it's kind of pricey, and you can't really afford to go to this restaurant. So your grandmother gets you a gift card to this restaurant, and her gift card pays for half the meal. So now you just have to pay half of it. You've gotten it half off. You can afford that, so now you go. Because what they've done is they've made it more favorable. This is what reactions, uh, what catalysts do. They make reactions more favorable. If we were to look at a reaction, this hill that we have to overcome called activation energy – would have been much higher, but if we add an enzyme, that activation energy is lowered, making the reaction more favorable. So the function of them is to lower the energy needed, called the activation energy. It lowers the activation energy required to make a reaction happen, making the reaction more favorable. And they are oftentimes many reactions. We have what is called metabolic pathways. Now, what is a metabolic pathway? Basically, a metabolic pathway is this. Let me kind of explain a metabolic pathway real quick. Let's say I have substance A. And we have a reaction where enzyme 1 makes substance B out of A. And then an enzyme 2 makes substance C. And an enzyme 3 makes substance D. Okay? This would be a metabolic pathway. The product of this pathway, D, could not have happened if there wasn't a series of stepwise reactions that happened where each step had an enzyme that catalyzed that step.
that's a metabolic pathway. Okay, when you guys learn cellular respiration in, in microbiology, when you learn citric acid cycle, glycolysis, all that good stuff, those are metabolic pathways. Okay. All right, now metabolic reactions, they we have metabolism is just all the reactions going on in your body. The sum total of all the chemical reactions happening in a body is called metabolism. All the reactions going on in your body, it's metabolism. Now, metabolic reactions, these all of these could be one of two kinds of reactions. They could be intergonic or exergonic. If they're intergonic, they use up energy. It means inward energy. Intergonic literally means inward energy. Like A plus B plus energy makes AB. Exergonic literally means outward energy. Reactions give off energy like heat or light. For example, AB is broken down into A plus B and energy is given off. Okay? So we are going to end here and start with water in the next lecture. Guys, thank you, and we are now halfway through the chemistry.